buddy. Yes. If you're a longtime listener of this podcast, then you know two things. First and foremost, my kids suck. <laughs> and two, that I am a lover mm-hmm. of history. <laughs> I am a regular historiacalinarianist. Uh huh. It's a technical term. I'm was a storyteller. Just, was just saying that yesterday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm a storyteller, too, with my own unique style and voice. And what I like to do is occasionally get a story from history and rework it into my own unique voice. And that's what this is. Another installment of our long running feature, Steve's Historical Approximations. (laughs) This is a new reoccurring bit for the podcast. What was the reoccurring bit that was in this position last week on the podcast? Uh, the answer to that is shut your damn mouth <laughs> is what was here last week. I'm sorry. I'm just still very bitter. Yes. And once again, once again, I would like to uh, explain. This is a 100 percent accurate piece of history that has been slightly reworded into my own voice. And as such, it isn't 110 percent accurate, but it's not a lie it's more like 92 to 96 percent accurate and this week we will be discovering we will be discussing the discovery of an element on the periodic table and how the discovery has to do with massive amounts of priest urine (laughs) boom priest urine like ridiculous amount. You can Ridic- get that over the counter now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, mm-hmm. so it's the 1660s in Germany. Okay, that was such a long time ago that they didn't even have iPhones back then. No, can you believe that? Everybody was walking around with uh, Samsungs and clamshells. It was it, <laughs> it was a different time. It was a different time. So there's this guy, and his name is Hennig Brand. As far as I can tell, he had two last names. Yes. Uh, Johnson Smith. (laughs) Hennig Brand. He was born in 1630 in Hamburg. Uh, So I'm assuming that he, you know, was listening to the Beatles. Um, I I would think he would have to be. Yeah. Yeah. He was an apprentice before they got good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was an apprentice glassmaker when he was younger, but then he left the world of uh, bong making, I guess, <laughs> to go into the army. So he was a junior army officer in I don't know the Forty Year Baguette War or, so, or something like that. It yes. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the war was, but I like the term junior army officer. Uh-huh. Because it sounds like they're just all short guys, you know. <laughs> we represent <laughs> a German army, a German army. You know what that reminds me of, too? I I was obsessed with a series of toys when I was younger. Toys growing up. They were called army ants. Army ants? Yeah, it was the late. 80s and they were uh, two warring teams of ants. There were orange ants and they were blue ants. And and both sides had like 40 different types of, of figures. There were paratroopers that came with little parachutes and they were like gunners and snipers and <laughs> guys with walkie talkies. They were literally army ants. <laughs> they came in like That's packs of four cute. And I I I had so many of those stupid army ants. I was a sucker for collecting massive amounts of things. Yeah. When I was younger, uh, that's it. There was also muscles, which stood for millions of unusual small creatures lurking everywhere. And I had so many of those. I still have them occasionally. I'll just be cleaning the house and, oh, look, I found a muscle from 1986. <laughs> so anyway, Hennig Brand. After the war, his social standing was up a little bit, you know? Yeah. War does that to people. Just watch Act One of Hamilton. Mm-hmm. It's basically the main plot of Act One of Hamilton. 
So Hennig Brand, after the war, ends up marrying way above his standing this uh, rich woman from a rich family, a huge ass dowry. Suddenly, Hennig Brand is a rich ass motherfucker. Okay. He got a crap ton of money. But here's the crazy part. Shortly after that, Hennig Brand's wife dies unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So Hennig Brand has all of this money and he's like, what am I going to do now? I know. And he ends up marrying an even richer woman. (laughs) So now this dude, Hennig Brand, is like double super rich. Yeah. So he's sitting on all of this money and he's wondering, what am I going to do with all of this freaking money? Well, I get what what do what do like uh, middle aged men do when they suddenly have a massive amount of money? Well, I guess I'll go buy a Harley Davidson and start a ridiculously huge LP collection. (laughs) Oh, snap. Those don't exist yet. Well, damn. What am I going to do with all this money? Well. I guess I'll just get into alchemy then. (laughs) So again, it's like the 1660s. I'm assuming alchemy was like golf. Yeah. Oh, what should I do with all my free time and money? Well, I could go golf, but that hasn't been invented yet. I know. I'll try and turn things into gold. Mm -hmm. Just what you do with your free time then. So it's the 1660s. Alchemy was very in back then. Chic. It it was the hip thing to do. It just reminds me really quickly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have all at one time or another tried to see if we had the force. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. And you remember how, you know, whatever object you were trying to move or whatever. Remember how hard you would stare at it and concentrate? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So even if you had the force, you had some psychic powers, it's still easier to just get up and get the fucking thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to interject with that. No, it's okay. So alchemy is basically science via magic. So... What are you alchemizing today, Ernestine? <laughs> oh, oh, nothing much. Just uh, working on a magic powder that makes people immortal. Isaac Newton How, was it an alchemist. Yeah. How about you, Ulysses? Well, I'm working on creating a glowing metal that cures syphilis. Science! <laughs> and so a lot of this alchemy was dedicated to the belief that it was possible to turn anything into gold. So Hennig Brand became obsessed with this. He was obsessed with trying to get things and turn them into gold. And he had this massive lab in his basement. Yeah. This massive basement. He got a lab. He hired his stepson to be his lab assistant. Jared. And he was like, and he was just convinced that he could find the philosopher's stone, mm-hmm. the like mythical thing that will just turn blank into gold so he's like so hennig brand is just obsessed with this i'm gonna do it man i'm gonna put my enormous wealth towards turning things into gold let me use my first class scientific knowledge to figure this out what can i turn into gold hmm well first off you know what would make this easy Whatever I get to turn into gold, it should probably be gold already. That is genius. Yeah. Yeah. So I need a large amount of something gold colored. Uh huh. And I can use my sciencey alchemy stuff to turn into gold. Huh. But <laughs> what? What thing out there is gold colored and freely available? That I could turn into gold. Hmm. (laughs) Think, 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 think. I know. I got it. Okay. I, I need piss. (laughs) Okay. So Hennig Brand became convinced that he could turn urine into gold. And like his people 
were like, okay, Hennig Brand, you're kind of fucking insane. Like, there's no way that this will work. And But the way that Hennig Brand figured that he would succeed where others have failed was, see, the reason why other people failed at turning urine into gold was because those people were using too little piss. Uh... And Hennig Brand wasn't going to go down like that. Yeah. So he built this giant lab. He got he got his assistant, which was his stepson, and this is basically cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> and he put out the call, people of uh, Germany, for scientific purposes, I need to get your pee. <laughs> purely science, purely yeah. science. I need your. I need everyone's piss. So this guy, Hannick Brand, he, he goes out and he's collecting pee in <laughs> jars and keeping them in his massive basement laboratory. Imagine, if you will, <laughs> what his lab smelled like. And it's a shame that Gatorade bottles were not yet invented either. Right? Thousands of jars of urine being kept months on end. <laughs> He would get he would get pee from from like uh, taverns and bars, so beer drinkers, and you know that 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 beer pee yes is different than like regular pee, so it's all like frothy. Yes, he's got like frothy beer. Pee. He's going to schools and he's getting urine from these different schools. And one account in history says. That he managed to get just a crap ton of jars of pee <laughs> from the local monastery. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Holy priest urine, Batman. Is, <laughs> it was a very weird episode of Adam West's Batman. Yes. That was the one episode that they never showed on air. No, but it's probably online. You would have to look. Yeah, it's got to be online. Holy priest, you're in Batman. <laughs> I personally feel that you could probably do something cool with like 50 jars of a priest's urine. I'm not sure what. <laughs> but you could probably it's do worth, something. Cool it's with worth a Google. <laughs> yeah, it's worth a Google. What can you do with 50 jars of priest's urine yes. and search? Oh, look at that. The FBI is knocking. <laughs> open up Esteban oh god yes they, they would definitely refer to you as Esteban yep so how serious was Hennig Brand about his urine collecting well accounts from the time say that he stored roughly 1,500 Gallons of urine. Gallons. Not 1,500 jars of urine. 1,500 gallons of pee. <laughs> but that's not, that's not, it's so alchemy. Dude's yes. trying to turn this pee, 1,500 gallons of pee into gold. How? By cooking it. By cooking it. In the pee? No, by cooking the pee. Oh, by cooking the pee. Imagine again, if you will, the smell of cooking and boiling 1,500 <laughs> gallons of old urine. Ah, uh, yeah. What did that lab smell like? What did the whole house smell like? Because you can't keep that smell in the basement in the 1660s. <laughs> you can't keep that smell in the basement now. What did that smell like? Now, in Even my mind... Even the asparagus said, we're out of here. <laughs> yeah. In my mind, I I hearken back to the Arizona State Fair. Okay. There were porta-potties, and, and those weren't that bad. Then there were some indoor uh, uh, urinals, like in the county exhibits and, mm. and, and, and places where the bathrooms weren't that bad. But... If you were over by the tiny stadium where they did like the the monster truck stuff and the demolition derbies, yeah. all of those bathrooms were those trough bathrooms. Oh yes. 
where it's just a trough on the wall and you're peeing there literally elbow to elbow with like six other drunk dudes. Yeah. I imagine that smell times a thousand. <laughs> is the type of smell we're talking about here. Uh-huh. Like, what the fuck? So this is how it happened. So he's cooking strangers urine. Mm -hmm. Like you do. Yeah. So he's heating up. So, so, so he's not getting anywhere with it. So he's trying to do different sort of things. He notices that when he has removed the urine from the jar, uh -huh. that there's this like slimy residue that's left behind. Especially. Yeah, okay. Especially like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you've got a boiling piss on a furnace and there's this like residue that's left over. So he's, so he starts experimenting with the leftover residue from boiling a jar of urine for like five days. And he's like, what is this strange uh, residue? Huh? What does it do? It doesn't do anything. Is this gold? I don't know. Maybe if I light it on fire, suddenly there's a huge fire in the lab. <laughs> suddenly the jar that he was using is full of glowing fumes. Okay. And a glowing white hot liquid drips out of the jar and it just bursts the lab into flames. So our boy, the urine scientist, what he does is he catches this glowing liquid in a jar and he notices that now the jar is glowing this bright green light. Okay, cool. Like, oh, shit, I, I did something. I don't know what the hell I did because it's the 1660s, but I sure, I sure shit did something. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I've got this like glowing green magical thing in this jar huh i don't know what the hell i just did but i do know this my glowing magic urine jars and i are going on tour <laughs> so he travels all over the place with his magical glowing pee and people love it they're going fucking ape shit they've never seen anything like this before suddenly this alchemist shows up with these giant neon glowing green jars and they're like oh my god we've i've never seen anything like that wow how did you make that what's the recipe how did you make that and hennig brand is like oh it's you know what that's not important right now <laughs> uh, um trade secret i'm not going to tell you how i got these magical glowing jars also don't smell them but what matters is i totes created this brand new thing uh it, it's an element I call it, I call it glowing piss juice. No, that's not good. How about piss ants? No, but that's closer. Ah, phosphorus. Phosphorus, okay. This strange, rich, alchemist, golden shower, German motherfucker uh, discovered I a freaking element by cooking the urine of priests. <laughs> and that is a fact. How batshit crazy is that, right? That is pretty batshit crazy. That's some crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. That's some crazy stuff. Oh, I need to go pee. Here, let me save it in this jar and start cooking it in the hopes of turning it into <laughs> gold. And that's a true story. That's a true story. A much, 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 much cleaner version of that can be heard on NPR, National Public Radio. <laughs> I, I I I knew it couldn't be, but I was still hoping it would be uranium. Oh no, that would have been great. That would have been great. Yeah. And that is it for Steve's historical approximations this week. Oh, what did we do this time last week? Ha 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 ha! Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Join us next week for more historically accurate inaccuracy with yet another installment of Steve's historical approximations. Next week, we're going to be talking about the importance of Pac-Man fever. Yes. There's a, there's a story to this that, 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 that breaks my heart. Honestly, I've got a heartbreaking story regarding Pac-Man fever. That's what we're going to be talking about next week. So cut on that.
I, I, you sure enjoyed it for I, more I, Steve approximations. I do hope that it contains the information that that Pac Man was originally Puck Man. I will. I will add that. I will add that to the story. Yeah, I'm big. Um, I'm just a real big uh, Scott Pilgrim fan. That movie really grows on you. It does. It does. Yeah, it's wonderful. I've got a picture somewhere, but uh, Emerald asked to to like do something. I don't remember what. Like she wanted to go out, or she wanted to use my computer or something. And I said, every once in a while, I will allow the kids to do something they want to do, but only if they do something. Uh-huh. So like Emerald wanted to do something and I said, Yes, all you have to do is just draw a picture from Scott Pilgrim. What? I'm sorry. It's okay. I told Emerald like you can do the thing you want to do, you just have to draw a scene from Scott Pilgrim for me. Okay. That's all you have to do. And she said no, and she said no, and she said no, and then there was silence, and then she said, Okay, this came out pretty good. <laughs> it's just a picture of the back of Scott Pilgrim sitting down on the floor uh, with his legs crossed waiting for the package in front of the door yeah and it's just such a simple drawing because it's just a guy sitting in front of a door but if you know Scott Pilgrim it's a beautiful fucking picture mm-hmm. you know she did a really good job it's a really good picture I'll have to track it down because I love that I love that so much <laughs> but that's next week be yes. sure and join us next week for more Steve's historical approximation with jazz hands. Yeah. And cut.